Well, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. And I'd like to welcome you to SEI's 2021 Research Review, one of the highlights of our year. Uh, I'm Paul Nielsen, the Director and CEO of the Software Engineering Institute. It's been my honor to be here for 17 years now, leading this uh, exciting team and this exciting work ever since I retired from the Air Force. Now, many of you know we'd hoped to be in person this year, but uh, with the, the surge of uh, the Delta variant of COVID, we decided kind of in the August timeframe that we really had to stay virtual. And as you know, virtual has some benefits. Uh, when we're virtual, we have a lot more audience part participation actually. And uh, it's a little bit easier for people to join us without the travel and the other expenses that uh, occur. Now for all of us at the Software Engineering Institute, this is a really exciting time because of the three main thrusts that we're involved with, software engineering, cybersecurity engineering, and AI engineering. Each is advancing quickly, and each has become critical to our national security, our economy, and our quality of life. For our sponsors and colleagues, software offers us an asymmetric advantage, the ability to continuously develop integrate and deploy new capabilities to soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and guardians globally. Software allows us to break the long-term trend toward longer and longer development and fielding times, to be able to modify and improve systems while in the field, while in flight, even while in the fight. Furthermore, the synergy among these three 21st century technologies, software, cyber, and AI, make them even more powerful. Software is the foundation of cyber and AI. Cyber is critical for software and AI. And AI offers new solutions to problems we've seen in software and cyber. Now, for the next three days, you'll hear from SEI's researchers, as well as from customers, colleagues, and sponsors. You'll hear how we have taken the DevSecOps approach from, for software development and adapted it to our research program to lead to a more continuous flow of research uh, to address users' needs, to stay connected with operational issues, and to deploy solutions of what I call software cycle time instead of hardware cycle time. Now we've got an exciting cast of people over the next three days, going from uh, you know five or so hours a day to be able to be kind to the people on the West Coast as well as the people on the East Coast. And uh, we're gonna start off with some really key, key people, especially a key talk from uh, the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Ms. Heidi Shu. But first I'm gonna turn this over to our CTO, Tom Longstaff, to get things going. So Tom, over to you. Thank you so much, Paul. And look, welcome everybody. I, I, am, I am absolutely thrilled that you're here with us on this second annual uh, virtual uh, it, uh, research review that we've got uh, lined up for you. Uh, got a great set of three days that are going on. And I just wanna set a couple of minutes of context as we uh, begin to launch into launch into the day and to the week. Um, for those of you that are really aware of the SEI and sort of know us well, uh, you'll know that we have four enduring challenges that have started since we were created in 1984. We work with software of all kinds to be affordable, to be trustworthy, to be capable, and to be timely. So the, the presentations you're going to see over the next three days with our researchers focus in on each one of these metrics and show how our research is really driving that within the software, cyber, and AI world so that all of these four elements become key to the future of DOD and the future of software within DOD. Uh, this you know, is really the key reason the SEI exists to really begin to put this forward. So today, for example, we're mostly gonna be focused around the capable, and the uh, timely aspects of our software research. Tomorrow, we'll focus largely on the trustworthiness as we go through. And affordability, you'll see sort of throughout 
as we sort of move through all of the presentations over the next three days. But we have a great lineup that's going on today. Um, after our keynote, I'm going to be turning over the Master of Ceremonies role to Ipek Askaya today, who's going to really lead us through the other portions of our, uh, of our presentations that we have. Um, but let me just talk a little bit more in terms of the, what we're doing here. In context of where we're going, the way that the SEI really operates is that there are an awful lot of challenges out there in the world that happen through DOD and beyond. So we get constantly uh, requested to do all kinds of research. But as an FFRDC, we have a deliberately limited scope of what we can do with regard to the amount of work that we can do for DOD. So we have to be very, very choosy in terms of the kind of work that we actually implement. So of all the people out there that can work, we discover the barriers and enablers that will really help the DOD move forward. We identify those and align them with the technical objectives and our portfolio. And this will really align up well with what we're gonna see from Ms. Shu in just a few minutes with regard to where the DOD is really moving with the research objective. And then we execute this through a series of studying the problems, creating prototypes and making prototypes, transitioning those directly into DOD and transferring that when we've got it to the point where the private sector can take over in a lot of these research areas. And as Paul alluded to, we've created a new type of research cycle that differs from the way research is traditionally done. We integrate customer views directly into the early days of research. We work with our DOD and government customers when we create prototypes, and we feed that directly back in real time in a very tight cycle to our researchers so that we are always incrementally improving how the research is executed. So it's a little different than saying, take a 10-year grant, do some research, and then see where that research might land. We're working in a much more agile and much more effective way of doing some direct fundamental research transition into DOD. All of the research you're going to hear in this three days are fundamental research that focus on collaboration. Collaboration with CMU, with our DOD customers, and with the rest of the world that are sort of working out there. That's why we really call the whole theme of this structure the collaboration effect. Our collaboration effect starts with really fundamental R&D. You're gonna hear a lot of the fundamental R&D that we work that produces pilots informing more R&D, which informs more pilots. Then go in that tight cycle that's sort of in and out. So technical papers, prototypes and tools, they're really important to us even today, even still in the way things are moving. But we also curate data sets and mature solutions that can be used and sort of go directly out within DOD. All of these basically create a science-based shaping of the research that are out there for a broader application of research and technology. So that's the nature of where our research and whatnot moves from today. And just a couple of things before I, I bring on Ms. Shu. Um, we have a recent release that just happened on a national agenda for software engineering. If you go to the front webpage at the SEI, you'll see links directly to this exciting new report that maps out a roadmap for research in software engineering over the next 10 years. And that's just been a year long effort with external experts and collaboration all the way through to create this great roadmap. I really encourage you to go take a look at that. And we're gonna have a panel specifically focused on that research agenda by the end of the three days. We've also done something new today, those of you that are getting into the virtual reality world. If you look at the overview page on the website, you'll see a link to a virtual reality tour of the SEI. So we had hoped to have everybody here in person. Since we can't have you here in person, uh, we created a virtual reality tour that takes some of the key areas as a pilot. So if you have a VR headset and can get to it, uh, I encourage you try to, uh, Give us some feedback on this pilot of a VR set of uh, the SEI and Carnegie Mellon, the campus that's there. We also have a digital program book. So just as if you've gone to the theater these days, you often get a digital 
playbill, we have a digital program book for the next three days. And that's also easily available from the website. If you want to follow along, read some background information and link into other things that are happening with our researchers. So that's enough, I think, introduction. I think what I'd like to do at this point uh, is to move over to introducing our keynote address for the day. I know that Ms. Shu is standing by uh, and I can see sort of what's happening there. So if I just need to, unfortunately, pull up a different window. Uh, I've got too many windows covering various things here. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, in terms of where things are. But I know it's here. There we go. So Ms. Heidi Shu is the Undersecretary for Defense for Research and Engineering, OS, uh, basically Office of the, of the Secretary of Defense and Research and Engineering. In this role, she serves as the Chief Technology Officer for the Department of Defense, mandated with insurance the, ensuring the technological superiority of the U.S. military and is responsible for the research, development, and prototyping activities across the DOD enterprise. She also oversees the activities of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, the Missile Defense Agency, MDA, and the Defense Innovation Unit, DIU, and the Space Development Agency, SDA, the DOD Laboratory and Engineering Center Enterprise, and the undersecretary staff focused on the developing advanced technologies and capabilities for the U.S. military. Previously, Ms. Hsu served as the Assistant Secretary for the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology from September 2012 to January 2016. Prior to this, she was acting beginning in June 2011 uh, as the uh, ASA um, uh, acquisition lead and appointed the principal deputy. Uh, prince, sorry, the principal deputy in November 2010. Prior to government service, Ms. Shu was the vice president of technology strategy for Raytheon Space and Airborne Systems. She holds a bachelor of science degree in mathematics from the University of New Brunswick in Canada, a master of science degree in mathematics from the University of Toronto, master of science degree in system sciences from UCLA and the engineering degree for, and an engineering degree from UCLA. She received an honorary doctorate in science from UNB. She's also a graduate of the UCLA Executive Management Course Program. On a more personal note, Ms. Shu has been involved on the, on the technical advisory group for the Software Engineering Institute for some time, and her advice and comments have been extremely valuable in helping to shape the direction of the SEI moving forward. With that, I would like to introduce, please, Ms. Heidi Shu. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important SEI research review. I know that I have always enjoyed listening to the researchers uh, at this uh, particular review, usually in person, but uh, I can tell you that I'm delighted to be able to dialogue with you guys uh, virtually. What I would like to do is to share with you a uh, what I consider a 100,000 foot view of what is happening in the world of research and engineering within OSD and, and to discuss uh, how software engineering plays a critical part. Okay, So the pandemic certainly has forced us to lean into technology as a way to accomplish day-to-day -day tasks. Uh, certainly pre-pandemic, I, I rarely did virtual speeches, <laughs> okay? So what we're clearly accelerating is the technological changes that's in our lives. Um, as the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, I believe the way to build confidence amidst the technology disruptions is to embrace these changes and move forward rapidly. Furthering science and technology innovation across the department could not be more important than it is today. Uh, many potential adversaries will have greater access to commercial state-of-the-art technologies than ever before, and that could greatly disrupt our nation. We cannot afford a leveling of technology advantage. Mm. The challenges that's facing our military are both diverse and complex, ranging from sophisticated cyber attacks to supply chain risks mm. to defense against hypersonic missiles to responding to bio threats. To address these challenges, the department must harness the incredible innovation ecosystem 
both domestically and globally in order to stay ahead of our adversaries. So my strategy in terms of meeting these challenges is built upon three pillars, leveraging the incredible amount of technology innovation across our nation to solve the toughest operational challenges and setting the foundation to build a future workforce and finally maximizing our asymmetric advantage by partnering with our larger innovation ecosystem. This of course includes universities, uh, university affiliated research center or UARGs or federally funded research centers, the FFRDCs, the defense industry and commercial sectors. And of course, our allies and partners. By working together, I believe that we can solve the toughest challenges. The commercial industry is spending far more money in research and development than the DOD is now in many critical areas. We need to leverage the R&D investment and accelerate incorporation of the latest commercial technologies into the DOD and not try to compete with them or try to replicate their research. The DOD's R&E money must be focused on developing innovative technologies that we uniquely need that the commercial industry has no business interest that warrant their investment. To more effectively do this, we are working to shift away from the traditional linear systems development process to a more nimbler approach that seeks to iterate the design, to build prototypes, experiment, and rapidly transition systems for operational use. This can dramatically shorten the cycle time and enable us to fuel capabilities more rapidly and deliver the military advantage that our nation needs. So on the topic of prototyping, the department established a new initiative called the Rapid Defense Experimentation Reserve. Sometimes you've heard about the word RADER, R-D-E-R, under the Innovation Steering Group. So the Innovation Steering Group actually was formed before I stepped into office. So on my very first day into the office, I met with the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kath Hicks, and she told me, by the way, you're chairing the Innovation Steering Group. <laughs> so that was great. Um, so the Innovation Steering Group serves as a principal forum to drive systemic strategy, policy, programmatic, cultural and budgetary changes that will allow the department to more effectively identify, to invest and transition capability past the valley of death to the warfighter. So to achieve this, the group initially focused on three priority areas, mapping the department's innovation organizations, bolstering joint experimentation and enhancing the research lab and test infrastructure. Okay. So let me talk, touch upon a little bit upon each one of those. In mapping the department's innovation organization, the Innovation Steering Group will provide information uh, that's on how each of the disparate innovation organization is, can better align, uh, namely, we're in the process of digging into the details across DIU, AFWORK, SOFTWORKS, you name it, uh, Army uh, Rapid Capability, Critical Technology Office, uh, Army uh, Application Lab. Or there's multiple entities all rapidly innovating and doing things. What I'm trying to do is get my arms around it. Who has the best process, right? Who's doing what? Uh, what problem are they trying to solve? And who have they funded? How well have these technology or products transitioned? And we should be able to share these information across the board. So the second piece is bolstering the department's joint experimentation, how we can rapidly test disruptive technologies and transition new capabilities, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. The third piece is enhancing research 
labs and test infrastructures that will help us to attract top talent and bring innovation into the department. So the intent of the Raider initiative is to encourage prototyping and experimentation in order to support joint warfighting concepts, such as the information advantage, joint fires, all domain command and control, and contested logistics. So what we have done is taking the capability gaps we have in those areas and mapped it to specific scenarios. And from that, uh, one of the things that we have done is look to the services and co-coms and uh, ask them if they have ideas that's uh, relatively mature technology, namely TRL level five to seven range, if they want to bring their prototypes and do a joint experimentation that we're going to conduct in FY23. Okay. Uh, I can tell you that two, in, within five weeks, we received 203 ideas. From the 203 ideas, we rack and stack uh, and identify the one that can best fulfill the joint capability gaps. And we're going to fund the top 32, okay? And uh, this is pretty exciting. We briefed out to all the services, uh, the vice chairman and DepSec Dev and all the co-coms. And there was a lot of excitement in terms of what we're doing. The next piece that um, was the question that was obviously asked by, by its co-con commander is how we're gonna transition this, okay? There's multiple paths we can transition the, uh, these different products and technologies. Namely, we could go to rapid fielding or we could, or if the co-con say, I like the capability here, but I'd like to have add additional feature, uh, we can do that and come back the next year to test it test it at the next joint experimentation again, okay? Or we can go into a mid-tier acquisition to field within five years, okay? Or uh, the co con could say, it doesn't have sufficient utility. So we can say, that's fine. Okay, we won't continue with that, okay? So this is a rapid experiment that we plan to conduct every single year. We also plan to increase opportunities to include our allies and partners in these experiments. Uh, the first tranche of experiments that we're doing in FI23 has three projects that's joined, two with Australia and one with UK. Okay. So the insights, the lessons learned with our allies and partner will only increase our chances of success. So the key is to find these cooperative opportunities that center around our common priorities and pursue efforts that will benefit both nations. Okay. So let me share some of our top uh, technology priority areas with you. This is where I would like to see innovation. Okay. Um, the commercial industry is spending billions of dollars in AI and autonomy. I would like to ensure that we develop trusted AI and trusted autonomy that are resilient to spoofing. I would like to see evidence-based AI assurance and the ability to dial the level of autonomy. Because the first time this autonomy platform whether it is airborne, on the ground, on surface, or whatever, or undersea, if that does something that the user and operator did not anticipate, you will lose trust in this unmanned platform. So th therefore, my focus is on trusted AI and trusted autonomy. The next area of uh, technology that I think it's critical to our success is an integrated network system of systems that are secure and resilient. We have many disparate uh, nodes of communication 
and disparate platforms, what I want to do is be able to stitch those together to enable them to communicate. Third area is area of high energy lasers that can counter missiles and man systems. Uh, we are finally at the cusp of uh, delivering prototypes to the warfighters so they can literally develop their TTPs, right? Uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures, that is, <laughs> okay? Um, so I'm very excited about that. Fourth is resilient space. Uh, what we need is resilient space situation awareness and space control, okay? Uh, that's robust enough to provide redundancy. Next piece is uh, integrated sensors that has the ability to operate in the intersection of cyber, EW, radar communications so that we can counter advanced threats with agility. Okay. The next piece is part of the human machine interface. And the way to think about it, I'm very interested in interactive virtual 3D op centers, enabling geographically distributed and dispersed command and control in a low bandwidth environment to, in, to enable us to rapidly conduct mission planning and mission command. Okay. Next piece is hypersonics. As you guys have all heard the news in the area of hypersonics, our adversary are rapidly developing capabilities in this area. I'm looking uh, forward to driving the cost of hypersonics down uh, so we can obviously uh, afford to buy more of them, okay? And the other piece I think is very in uh, important for us to think about is in the area of microelectronics. As uh, all of you guys have seen, the supply chain disruption that has occurred uh, this year 70% uh, of our microelectronics is offshore in Asia. That poses a significant supply chain risk to us. This is why there is so much interest to, to reshore uh, the microelectronics foundry. So the Senate has uh, pushed forward uh, $52 billion dollars in terms of helping to establish and stand up uh, our own capability on shore. And what we are doing, we're working very closely with all the departments and all the agencies to make sure that we can focus on leveraging the state-of-the-art commercial foundries uh, in terms of uh, uh, fabrication. So the initiative that we put forward spans from leap ahead technology at DARPA to lab to fab in terms of microelectronics comments to existing fab shops. I'm gonna talk about uh, software in, in a minute. I, I want to touch upon the area of emerging technologies. Uh, one of the key emerging area that clearly is a race going on is in the area of quantum science. Okay, so uh, you guys can see quantum computers. There's over 200 companies just within the U.S. all racing to be the first to develop uh, uh, quantum computers, and there is a significant equity investment in this area. So certainly quantum sensors, quantum computers are areas we're very interested in. Uh, biotech is going to revolutionize the way we sense and prevent surprises and reduce our logistics burden. If you think about what DARPA was able to accomplish in August, they went to Guam and within two days, they were able to use water, sand and biotech 
and developed a helicopter landing pad in 48 hours. Now, when we are in a contested logistics environment, this is exactly what we need. Okay. And then the other emerging area uh, of uh, interest to me is advanced materials. Advanced materials that's going to be stronger and lighter because it reduces our logistics burden. It also helps us in um, many different areas in terms of reducing weight of our platforms. I'm interested in materials that can handle higher temperature, which is of course critical to our hypersonics. Okay. Materials that can produce higher efficiency. All of those advanced materials um, are critically important. Then the finally, the other area that in the emerging technology area I'm interested in is next G, namely beyond 5G, okay, to thrust the U.S. into an early leadership position. So U.S. industries innovations has provided a technical leadership position in many key areas that can be leveraged, like multifunctional array, right, 3D beam forming, uh, software-defined radios, uh, dynamic spectrum utilization, uh, waveform diversity, MIMO, et cetera. A lot of those critical emerging technology has significant application to next generation, of, namely 6G. Okay. So I like to get back to advanced computing and software. Okay. Software is absolutely ubiquitous in everything that we buy nowadays. We need resilient, assured software in our systems. We need to figure out how to containerize our legacy software that we have spent billions and billions of dollars developing and enable upgrades that doesn't cost billions and billions. Okay. We need to ensure interoperability that's across services and different domains. We need to head towards DevSecOps in all of our complex software intensive weapon systems. Okay. We are absolutely heading towards a zero trust architecture, but we need real time continuous risk monitoring and rapid incidents response. We need to rethink how we need to do development tests and operational tests for software intensive systems. We need to evolve to a model of continuous development and continuous test, right? We need modular open architecture with the isolation between hardware and software so we can rapidly upgrade the software and rapidly upgrade the secure processor underlying that. The Software Engineering Institute has a golden opportunity to shape the path that the Department of Defense is on, but providing leading edge research in these areas to help guide our path forward. Okay. In addition to research, I would highly encourage SCI to work with the services to tackle their toughest software challenges and transition capabilities to them. Once again, thank you very much for inviting me to this research review, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Heidi. Um, really inspiring words and uh, words that resonate so well with our researchers and our customers and collaborators that we have here. Um, Paul, I'm going to turn to you for a few minutes. Okay. You want to uh, start with some questions, and I encourage sure. folks on the webinar, please submit your questions online, um, and we will work with them uh, directly from, uh, from the ones that are submitted there. So I think the first question I've got is, is probably uh, too hard to answer, but I'm still going to ask. <laughs> you know, the, the U.S. always does its best when everybody pulls together. And so, but we're kind of in a time where we've got a little division in our government and even in our society. How do we, what can we all do to enhance the way the executive branch, the legislative branch, the defense, defense industrial base, 
academia and even the commercial sector work together. You mentioned how important the commercial sector is to us. How, how can we really make that gel and come together better? That's a great question, Paul. And that's part of my task. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell you in the area of defense, there's more uniformity in terms of coalescing yeah. on both, both sides of the aisle because everybody uh, believes that we need defense, right? And I think the key point here is sharing some threat data. This is where our threats are today. It's not where they're evolving to. This is their capability today, okay? And here's yeah. where we stand. Once you highlight that, and then you articulate, here are the things we absolutely must invest in and work together to collaborate and bring our capabilities much quicker to the hands of operator. There's nobody disagreeing with me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's sure. the beauty of it. Okay. What I have done on the radar side, uh, mm -hmm. I've briefed the HASC and the SASC PSMs. Uniformly, everybody's on board. That's okay. good. Yeah. Uh, so that's absolutely great. And I told you internally across the DOD, everybody was on board. Okay. Uh, what I have started doing is I've had two um, meetings with the CEOs of FFRDCs. And you were there, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and what I'm trying to do is sharing the threat data with you guys at the TSSCI level and understand this is where the threat is today and where they're heading and what we must do collectively together. So I'm encouraging collaboration. The other thing that I'm doing, I have engaged with the top seven primes CTOs, the yeah. chief technology officers. I'm doing the same thing by saying, here's my technology priority areas. What can you guys do namely investing in your R&D to solve these tough technical challenges, yeah. right? I have engaged quite a bit uh, also with small companies in multiple forums, uh, uh, in uh, video telecoms like this, visiting small companies, also sharing a critical technology capability gaps I would like them to work on. And finally, I've engaged uh, with... Uh, the Australian counterpart, uh, namely mm -hmm. defense chief scientists. Uh, we're setting up uh, bi-monthly telecons to engage a lot closer on number of topics I've touched upon. Uh, I've done the same thing with UK, with the Japanese, with Latvia, <laughs> so wow, yeah. with German. So you can see I'm engaging. I am increasing the yeah. international engagement as well. Oh, that's great. Well, we do want to tap into innovation wherever it is. And in our in the U.S., a lot of that innovation is out there in the commercial world, too, which is a wonderful thing for us. It's, a, it's one of those asymmetric advantages we have, actually. <laughs> absolutely, Paul. So I'm absolutely doing that. Um, everything you're talking about, I'm trying to increase, uh, increase uh, the scope and bring my arms around everybody who wants to collaborate to solve the toughest challenge as quickly as possible. Here's a question that came up from our audience, and it's kind of combining a couple of them plus something I was w wondering about, is uh, as we've started to develop software faster and deliver it faster, you know, through DevOps kind of approaches, mm -hmm. we, we actually go faster than sometimes the department's ready for it, <laughs> especially um, through the sort of rigorous uh, V&V concepts we have. Or even the the training that uh, you know our soldier sailors are, usually depend on. So, what can we do to kind of bring the training and the VNV communities more into this quicker cycle as we go forward? So, I, I will tell you, Paul, this is exactly a uh, critical area we need your help in. Okay, um, I've already challenged our development test folks to say, think about it. We need to change the way we do business right? We need to figure out how we pivot towards a continuous development, continuous test model. And um, we need to figure out how to bring in UARCs, FFRDCs who know how to do that and commercial companies who know how to do that. Yeah, right? yeah. 
So I encourage you guys to come up with ideas of how we can change the way we do business. And the other thing I will throw in your lap as well is think about once AI, we started adopting AI, how do we test that? Yeah, it's, it's opaque sometimes, isn't it? How it's making us decisions and such, yeah. Exactly. So these are the area, our fantastic research areas. If you guys could focus on that and come back to, um, come back to us with your recommendation, I am absolutely all yours. Okay. That, that actually does answer a question that also popped up in our audience from one of our friends at Lincoln Lab, you know, one of our tight colleagues. And that was, uh, what are your thoughts on AI engineering as a community discipline to ensure that robustness and trustworthiness and visibility into how things make decisions? And I think you pretty much answered that, that that's a, a top research area for us all to work on right now. You bet. Tom, do you have a question? I, I've got lots of questions. I could keep oh, going. <laughs> lots more. And, and this is a key one that, that also is very important uh, to us and to many people out there. But can you expand on how you foresee the evolution of verification and validation, uh, especially with the growing complexity of software technology and sort of how that is going to work? And if you could sort of bring in your partnership with DOT&E and uh, mm -hmm. ANS, I think uh, that would be key in, in this area. You're absolutely 100% correct. I've got to have the partnership from the research to the ANS to the to dot and &E, right? So one of the things that I'm planning to do as soon as there is a dot and &E person confirmed, <laughs> ANS person confirmed, <laughs> I will be able to have monthly um, meetings with them. But I'm actually having, even in the interim, have... Uh, Every other week, I have a meeting with ANS. Oh, good. I've also had meeting with uh, every other week with the CIO. So at least we're we're trying to bridge the gaps, right? Make sure the communications is transparent. Okay, but uh, you're absolutely right. I've engaged with DOT and E uh, with two meetings so far, but uh, again, I'm waiting for. Uh, the next step, namely, uh, when somebody confirms either my counterpart, then we can formulate some initiative and push ahead on, on them. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And, you know, related to this, you were key in a lot of the uh, report that we put together on the national agenda for the future of software engineering uh, in research. Um, how do you see the findings in that roadmap helping to drive some of the areas of focus that you see within R&E? Well, I will tell you just by uh, seeing uh, what you guys are uh, pushing for, one of the things I'm going to do is create a position for advanced computing and software, which was not a modernization priority before, mm -hmm. but now it is for me. <laughs> okay, so mm -hmm. positive thing is I'm listening, right? <laughs> when you guys talk, I'm actually listening. So that's great. <laughs> okay. Great. Paul, back over to you. Okay, well, um, I'm going to go over to the cyber side a little bit. You know, we've seen a, a big rise in so cybersecurity breaches, the rise of ransom attacks, and boy, these are getting national, international attention. Uh, everyone agrees it's a problem, and yet, in many cases, it, it's it, the vulnerabilities are from simple cyber hygiene that we should be able to handle. Now, there's, there's always advanced attacks, but how do we raise the floor in cyber so that uh, we get rid of these vulnerabilities that are due to cyber hygiene, especially as we go down in the supply chain, because we've got a big supply chain and everybody in that supply chain is important to us. Yeah, so this is exactly the part of discussion that's within the cyber council internally within the DOD that's ongoing. Oh, the thing that's kind of frustrating to me, even when I was back in the army, simple things like changing your password no, no. <laughs> yes. And uh, update your software, right? Um, it's just a simple things that eliminates a big chunk of the vulnerability that we absolutely have to do. The other thing is making sure that you can't get a waiver, right? That we're going to make sure that you have to do the, uh, the list of things that's, that's just common sense, okay? Uh, CMMC 2.0 uh, is rolling out, which is a simplified version of the CMMC 1.0, okay? Good. And we are anticipating all the defense contractors to have to apply, uh, comply to it. So there's a lot of the cybersecurity aspect that's built within there that they have to comply, okay? Yes. 
And the other things that we're doing is we that we have discussion internally within the DOD. It's helping out a smaller company who don't have the bandwidth to be able to handle this, right? So right. how do we, you know, provide the funding for a secure uh, cloud uh, to help the small company uh, to allow them to use the secure cloud? I see. Yes. Yes. So these are all the discussion that's ongoing internally within the department right now. Okay, so we're, we're absolutely focused on what you're talking about. Could I, could I build on that for just a moment? Um, you know, we talk a lot about traditional vulnerabilities and, and sort of those areas and testing those out. How does the incorporation of this new AI focus, especially with dialable autonomy, change <laughs> your view of, of how what we would even consider a vulnerability and how we would begin to worry about that integration of cyber and AI? This is not an easy topic. I'm <laughs> expecting you to help me solve it, <laughs> right? <laughs> so the reality is our adversaries working in the AI area. There's a lot of uh, research that's going on in that area. And I have no doubt that they are uh, incorporating autonomous AI into their NAM platforms and operating uh, that way. So not only do we have to uh, figure out how to operate AI with autonomy, with assurance, we have to also think about countering autonomy. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So right. Those, those all very rich research topic areas. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, Heidi, you had the advantage of coming into this job after being the ASAL, so kind of similar job in some ways, you know? And, uh, but I, I've always found when I went into a job, even if I thought I knew what I was getting into, there was always a surprise or two. Uh, what's, what's been your most pleasant surprise as you came in to this job, you know, where you felt, oh, I, I, things are better than I thought they were? Well, I will say, you know, I, the fact that I can focus a little bit more time and kind of shape the strategy for the, the entire department oh. in terms of where research engineer needs to go. So I'm able to kind of shape that. And that's the, you know, the things I'm, I'm very happy about, right? Yeah. Um, I think uh, the other thing, there just simply aren't enough hours in a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. But, you know, fortunately, you've got a, you got a whole defense industrial base supporting you and you've got an outstanding staff of people in the, in the Pentagon that are, are professionals that uh, help you on that. And you've got the services to help you in this, too. So you've got some resources at your, uh, at your beckon, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. But I, I can tell you, um, so I'm moving forward. I actually have a updated org chart. Literally, I'm going to probably this week. Uh, to go with, uh, to share it with uh, uh, DevSecDev, Dev, uh, get her bl blessing. Uh -huh. And within this new org chart, I've created some of the new positions, as I mentioned, you know, it's advanced computing and software. Yeah. It's a slot I would like to fill, right? Uh, getting her approval for some of these things like advanced materials, all the emerging areas, the topics I touched upon that wasn't there before, right? So those are the area and the position I would like to fill. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, I, I need to get her blessing on that before I can uh, do sure. the reorg. Okay, that's one piece. The other thing, just let you guys out, everything I kind of share with you uh, guys, about, um, we're actually going to release a document on the tech priorities, right? Okay. So uh, this will be great. But for finally, we'll actually have a document to kind of shape where we, where we would like to head, okay? And uh, that should be, re uh, we're going to get approval from DepSecDev uh, also this week, and then we'll be able to release that. Uh, okay. We will really look forward to seeing that. that. That will be key to helping to get us all aligned. Um, Heidi, we're at a, at a one of the you know the most advanced university in the world for AI. Well, we train the next generation uh, of everybody that's happening here, but we often talk about a lack of workforce development, sort of a, a lack of, of getting that next generation up. Where does that fit <laughs> in your sort of view of, of, of how R and E begins to shape the future? How do you interface with the workforce development and the next generation of uh, of our engineers? Uh, great question. One of the things that RE has done of, of, uh, across the Department of Defense 
is actually awarded 416 scholarships, okay, to undergraduate, master's, and PhD students in the area of topic in STEM that we're interested in, okay? So there's like 21 different STEM areas that we're interested in. We're happy to pay for your tuition, right? And it's basically when you finish, you get your degree, you will... Um, you would agree to come work in one of the DOD laboratories. So you have a full-time job waiting for you when you finish. Yeah. Yeah. That's how we're gonna build the workforce, right? I think that's a great way of doing it. The other thing is we have funded quite a few million dollars uh, to establish centers of excellences mm -hmm. at different universities. So once again, we're kind of nurturing a, seat, a center of excellence. Uh, for example, uh, we funded uh, Texas A&M uh, in uh, the area of uh, hypersonics. They're leading consortium of, of 90 universities, right, uh, in hypersonics. So we're in the process of doing uh, that. Probably, probably we'll probably increase more of that. But AI will be an important area to stand up a center of excellence. Would you like to volunteer? <laughs> 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 well, I think there's a lot of opportunity there, both for, uh, you know, collaboration, centers of excellence, students working directly hands-on within the research areas that we have and giving them yes. the opportunity to interface directly with the big needs that you're talking about within DOD. Um, we're down to just a few minutes left. Uh, Paul, do you have a, a sort of a closing uh, statement or question that you want to well, I, I got uh, well. I got two like little statements. One is I, I think the uh, somewhat of a focus on education and the workforce is just so important. You know, when we look back in our nation's history, the GI Bill, especially after World War II, when all those uh, soldiers and sailors came back from the war, it enabled so many to go to college, which really accelerated the, the all the development that happened in the fifties and sixties. You know, because we had so many more college educated people in our country to do this, and so it's it's time for us to do that again, especially with the the 21st century technologies like AI and software and bioengineering and such. So that's really a wonderful thing to see. The other thing I would just say is, man, I, I'm just so uh, so excited about having you in this job. Uh, you you bring special expertise and experience, and also a passion for the job. And that's it, it, all three are important in this business. Um, it's a it's a tough job though. I know, and it. Uh, uh, it, it takes it takes several hours in the day to do this job, doesn't it? <laughs> like 20 hours a day almost. And even then you can't finish it. So hopefully you'll, you'll keep your health up as you go through this and, uh, and, and depend on all your friends and colleagues that are in industry and inside the department to help you on this. You bet. By the way, Paul, I, I neg neglected to mention the fact that uh, we also funded, I think, seven different summer camps. They're uh -huh. STEM summer oh, nice. camps. Nice, nice. For junior high school kids, okay? Catch them early, catch them early, yes. Absolutely. Each one of them had uh, like uh, uh, between 50 to 200. Uh, so the pretty large size in terms of uh, junior high school, but they get five days of STEM summer camp. Wow. So once again, it's us encouraging, you know, the pipeline, right, into the STEM fields. So that's also something we're doing. And this is an excellent initiative sometimes to increase the diversity in our workforce, too, because you're catching people before they make some decisions that maybe make it harder for them to get back into that business. And, you know, that's, that's a great initiative. Heidi. Tom, I, I think I'm done. I'll leave it to you to close. So I think we're just about out of time. Heidi, is there any closing thought that you want to leave for, for our participants in, in terms of sort of a wrap-up thought? Yeah, so uh, I think SCI has tremendous potential to shape our future in so many areas that I've talked about. So I'm going to look uh, towards your organization to really help pave the future, right? And I think we are critically dependent upon uh, your research and your innovation in the area to say, this is where we need to go. You have a friend in court at a pretty high level, right? <laughs> so um, don't be a stranger. If you have great ideas, uh, I'm very interested in what you guys are doing. I would love to uh, hear your ideas. 
So thank you very much for this inv invitation to speak with you. I wish you all the best. I, I wish I, I could actually spend the next three days listening, but uh, unfortunately my schedule doesn't quite permit okay. me to do it. <laughs> but, but thank you very much for the invitation though. Well, thank you, Heidi. That was uh, uh, truly inspiring for all of us. And rest assured, you know, we at the SEI are going to do everything we can to step up and meet these needs and help support you and the department uh, in all the things that I think are coming to fruition within the work that we're doing and the research that, that we're trying to enable. So I thank you. Thank you for your leadership and vision. And thank you very much for spending some time with us today. Anytime. Thank you so much. so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.